Yo, yo, welcome to the show, it's the number one show, interviews and music, podcast you know, integrate the culture through the times, just sit back and chill, it's the roots and rhymes, roots and rhymes, roots and rhymes, just sit back and chill, it's the roots and rhymes, all you really need is some roots and rhymes, roots and rhymes, roots and rhymes. Hi, so welcome to the Roots and Rhymes podcast with myself, Chuns, and of course, I'm with my wingman, Mac. How you doing, Mac? I'm doing good, Chuns, how are you? Yeah, yeah, all good. Product of lockdown, and look at where we are now. It's unbelievable. I'm, I'm glad we've managed to stick with it. <laughs> I mean, me too. I mean, it's a better way of uh, spending time than doing other things. So Roots and Rams has really taken off. We've had some amazing guests. It's been such a productive uh, time and some great feedback. And I'm so, so sure that this episode is going to go out of the park. Oh, this is going to be uh, brilliant. This is going to be brilliant. It's I just know amazing. it. So also, I just want to let the listeners to um, want to let the listeners know uh, to get in touch. If they want to see any specific guests on the show, we'll try our best to get them on. Um, it can be absolutely anyone. They don't have to be musical artists. They can be comedians like we've got on today. A little sneak peek there. Um or they they can be uh, fashion designers anything that's in popular culture we want to tell their musical journey and how growing up in either in Britain or even if it's a Canadian artist or anything like that we want to understand what they went through um, in order to get where they are now and how music was a part of that journey so anybody um, wants to let us know they can let us know through Twitter at Roots and Rhymes or they can hit us up on Instagram as well at Roots and Rhymes and also make sure you follow on there subscribe to the podcast and we'll keep you up to date um, don't forget you'll also be able to catch the podcast on YouTube as well so we're going to be hitting up the YouTube channel and all of the content is going to be on there in visual. But for the best audio experience, you are better off subscribing on Apple Music, Spotify, or Google. So we're mixing it up today with a live recording um, and with the Zoom. So obviously we're kind of still in lockdown now. So we've had to switch up a bit, haven't we, Max? It's still a virtual sessions at the moment. I'm looking forward to getting to do this in person a lot more. But, you know, it's working out. We've had some great guests and the beauty of the Internet is means that we can connect with people from far distances away and bring, bring people to the show that otherwise we might not have been able to. Absolutely. And for this week's guest, she's going to bring some real comedy to the show. And I'm oh, really yeah. looking forward to having a conversation with that. Um, so without further ado, today's guest has become nothing short of a comedic viral sensation. She's the most relatable Punjabi comedian in the biz, and she's cameoed alongside some of the most biggest British movie greats. Musically, you could say she has a bit of an old soul, but I can assure you she's young and fresh. It's Suk Ojala. Oh my God, please can you introduce me onto anything? (laughs) Like the Apollo. I know, these are the guys I want. <laughs> Absolutely, so no problem. I'll be down for that. What about you, mate? Yeah, 100. percent I'm there. I'll go and wait outside now. <laughs> Roots and rhymes. Well, it hasn't been completely unproductive for you because congratulations on the book deal. That's that's amazing. Thank you. You're the first people I'm kind of talking to about it that like aren't my friends. That's yes. Great. Um, <laughs> really? Really? Uh, yeah. Look, that was. I honestly, the best thing, best thing that's ever happened to me. I say that about every great thing that's happened to me. But just, I'm, I'm so, so lucky. I think, you know, it was no secret. I'd kind of spoken about this on social media in the past where I was like, I'm kind of looking to move away from doing like traditional stand-up. Mm. I loved doing my show, you know. I was on the Live Six tour. I loved it. The reaction was brilliant. So many incredible experiences doing that. And I love doing that because I love connecting with people. To me, it's not about funny because mm. like, Anyone can be funny, you know. You sit yeah. on a banana skin, you're funny, you know, that's <laughs> funny. But it's like connection with people is so important. You know, yeah. you guys know this from the podcast, mm. you know. Having to connect with an audience is difficult, but it's so important. It's really crucial. And I think I was like, do I really, you know, I'm, I'm 36 now. I was like, do I really want to be trekking to some terrible club or some terrible pub in the middle of London mm. on a Wednesday night for no money, just to say, "Oh, I'm doing, I'm doing stand right. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Is you know, and I think definitely having this time off has made me go, "Okay, cool. What do I really need in my life to make me feel happy?" I was like, "Right, and you know, I want to spend time with my parents. I am a homebody. Like, I love being at home. You know, I love kind of just chilling. And, yeah. And I'm a, you know, and I was like, that doesn't really fit in with." Yeah. Like the life that I want. It's a hard grind. It is a really hard grind going to clubs and gigs and 
late nights and, and all that yeah, stuff. Like yeah, like putting yourself out there and like living off like Tesco meal deals and like yeah. you know when you're just like and you, then you just feel rubbish and then and because I'm a I'm an actress as well I'd mm. be like doing that gig and then on the way home it'd be in, I'd be on the train home at like midnight or whatever reading lines for an audition the next yeah, day yeah yeah and then and then you're up at like first thing in the morning and then it's like you don't eat properly because you're kind of snacking in between yeah yeah out so I don't feel connected to my body I'm not mm. drinking enough water and it all like you know, it just shows up in your skin and it your does yeah, absolutely, yeah I just I don't feel great like I don't mm. feel great about this and I think also like the more you do something I guess it's like this for you guys as well that like you start out in an industry and you think it's going to go somewhere and you think that's all I want to do that's all I want to do and then you get there and you're like this is great but I want to do more yeah. yeah and like writing for me has been something that obviously like I've always loved writing stories creative mm. writing was totally my jam like yep. did English literature at A level loved it loved it loved it but I guess in my head I was always like people who write books are really clever like people who write books did like yeah. an MA in creative writing <laughs> yeah, from, like, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I don't have I'm not I'm not academic in that way like I don't I love learning but I'm not like sit down write an essay type of academic and so when they approached me with this idea for a book deal and they were like, and this is like, what do you think about writing about this? I was like, yeah, I love this because like, where are the Punjabi female voices? Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah. TV or whether, you know, film or whatever. Rewind. Let's take it back. No, your roots. How old were you when you moved to, to out of Leeds? I was only four when I moved out, so I don't remember and much. And of you, it, escaped, but, uh, you escaped you escaped the accent rolling at four. I did I did. <laughs> I did I did have it when I was here and I, I did get bullied for it at school because they were like, She talks funny. Um but I don't yeah, I don't I don't have it. It comes out. It comes out if I'm around people with the Yorkshire yeah. accent. Does it? By the end of this accent, I'll I'll I end of this podcast, I'll be <laughs> full, full on Yorkshire. I'll be I'll be full, full on. on. I'll be, be full on. I'll be like <laughs> All right. Full on, full on, Chapel Town, all right. Yeah. Brilliant. So as you, as you said, you, you were born in Leeds and you lived the first four years of your life in Leeds and then you moved down to Kent uh, in, late, I'm assuming, late 80s, early 90s. What Very was good. the first song you remember hearing which made an impression on you around that time? It's so hard to say that. I've been thinking about this a lot. Uh, it's a weird one with me and music because I grew up in a house where, like, my parents are very strict observant people. Yeah. So we were not listening to, and also I'm an only child, so like I was not allowed to listen to any music that wasn't religious. Okay. So growing up, I I heard Geethan a yeah. lot. Mm. Like that's all I heard was like yeah. Geethan, a lot of Geethan, and the only kind of exposure I had to songs apart from like the odd Punjabi film that, you know, dad's recorded off the telly. Yeah. Um, it's back when they used to be on. Um, I, the only time I really heard music, I guess, was at wedding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so there's this, I remember, and the only reason I remember this song sticking out is because I remember, I mean, I guess this trend has come back now, but in the eighties, you know, like how everybody had a smoke machine. Yeah. At, at yeah. their wedding. Yeah, everybody yeah, had a yeah. Smoke, yeah. And it, and I'm just pretty sure it was like not safe <laughs> at all because they were like, I remember just like billowing smoke and feeling really claustrophobic <laughs> and it was like, it had a really yeah. weird smell and it made me feel a bit sick and, it, yeah. and I was like, oh, this is just horrible. Um, I'm sure like the smoke machine industry has come along since then. But the, <laughs> yeah, it's really the up this <laughs> game now and made it less <laughs> smells like, smell, but now it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is it? Oh gosh. I just remember like, it just being like really um, like confused and like discombobulated because yeah. you're on the dance floor as a kid yeah, and then yeah. you're like, oh my God, like, where's my, <laughs> where's heart? my family? I can't see anything. <laughs> yeah, that really, there's just it's like, like the blitz. The, this, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the song that I remember was playing was um, uh, Bolivin de Sufri Bardal Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. What and so you? I'm sure there's, I know, I'm sure there's like earlier songs that I remember, but I guess for me, I was always the one, as soon as I discovered headphones, uh, was the one kind of listening to music on the sly. 
like mm. constantly listening to music on set. And even now, like I'm 36, even now, like if I'm listening to like a bit of Drake or whatever, or like I've always got to yeah. kind of like turn it, turn it down or like put my headphones on. So yeah, so it's a bit of a weird one for me because music was kind of forbidden mm. in that way. Um, and I used to, I mean, I was one of those kids that learned how to do Ethan and play the harmonium. And so like that, I'm not musical at all. Mm. I cannot sing. I hated performing, if you can believe yeah. it. Uh, but yeah, I did it every week. You know, that's what your parents <laughs> tell you to do. So you do Absolutely, it along with yeah. Punjabi school and everything. So, so yeah, so I guess like definitely Punjabi, definitely like, you know, old school. And that's kind of where I've stuck. Yeah, <laughs> with, with old school. With my musical old school. <laughs> old, uh, yeah, Oldest yeah, gold yeah, yeah, old and all that. Is the one gold. That's it. Thank Absolutely. You. So... So you said that obviously uh, weddings and it was the Punjabi science, but was that the music that you always found yourself interested in in them early years or did you find yourself liking any other type of genres when you were younger? Yeah, definitely. I think I, I like properly for me, like discovered music around about like year eight at school. I yeah, remember yeah. like kind of discovering and then I was like into like Nirvana and mm. Blur. Um, I'm definitely team Oasis now. Like back, yeah. back then I was like... <laughs> Back then, Oasis were a bit scary and I didn't really get it. Now I'm like, Oasis are amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I watched the Supersonic documentary twice through and cried my way through it. You should um, hear Max's like... rendition That's of amazing. Wonderwall. Bloody amazing. hell. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> I mean, don't keep us waiting. No, no, no. Like, this, this, is, this is your time. This then... is your time, so I don't want to take away from you. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice, nice. You're Smooth. slippery there, you are. You're slippery there. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, so basically, that's I was kind of like that kind of indie, grungy kind of kid really yeah. into that really Brit into Pop Cooler Shaker kind. as well yeah, yeah. yeah like Cooler Shaker is really into um so those are the kind of songs that I'd I'd listen to um back then but then I think I went to a school that there weren't very many um other Punjabi girls hmm. there. it was an all-girls school of course mm-hmm. uh, but <laughs> not many other Punjabi girls there and I think it wasn't really cool to be Punjabi if you see what I mean yeah, like yeah. you know in the mainstream it wasn't yeah. this is like what 97 98 mm. uh, before kind of goodness gracious me came in but even then it's like it's a weird thing with your identity of course like when you're British and you're Asian and I think definitely I kind of downplayed my Asian side mm. in order to kind of get through yeah yeah, yeah. I think a lot point. of us have had to I do think that, you end up we? becoming a bit of a Sorry, yeah. on, I, think, mm. I think a lot of us have, have had to do that over the years to try and be accepted in what we're doing we kind of have to play yeah the role that we need to play to become accepted and absolutely it's like you kind of whitewash yourself a little bit, a little yeah, bit sure. don't you in absolutely. order to just kind yeah, of yeah yeah i didn't realize i was probably doing that until a, a much later age i mean because mm. obviously some some of the fr- some friends that i have uh they appear more punjabi than me i mean obviously i i am very much deep into my punjabi roots and i i speak punjabi and all that kind of stuff at home but mm. when i was at school i was almost a slightly different person and maybe yeah. that was a way of being accepted and yeah, I think that, that came through my music that I listened to as well like I don't know about mm. you but listening to Pajambi music in your headphones at school wasn't a cool thing no then, not at all it was like no I'm not listening all, to like Michael Jackson or I'm listening to Tupac <laughs> and that kind of stuff yeah, yeah weird isn't it how it's it just it kind of like less mm. than you know and I think mm. and like now there's a term for it so we understand it now we know what we were doing is code yeah. switching yeah um and you know and we kind of I think a lot of us do that like I know that if I'm in a generally you know look I work in the arts it's very white you know it's very white it's very male if I'm mm. in a group or you know if I'm in a meeting or whatever and I'm on a zoom call I'm the only Punjabi person there or the only person of color there I know that my accent mm. changes. Like yeah. it's kind of, I don't even have to think about switching. Like in, instantly you're talking a bit, you know, a bit more, yeah. you know, maybe you're enunciating I, a bit more. Maybe you're switching yeah, up a yeah. bit taller. Maybe your Punjabi accent comes out. <laughs> no, can you imagine? <laughs> you should do that just to mess with them next time. You should do that. I should do that. Way. Next time, next time I go and see my tongue, I'm a pilot of an eye. But the the thing is, you're absolutely right. You do you do end up enunciating a little bit more and sitting up a little bit taller. But the, the weird thing is, is that you still get the questions like, "Oh, yeah. so so where are you from?" or yeah. them kind of things, where you kind of think, yeah. "Oh, well, I'm, I'm from Kent." It's like, no, yeah, where are you yeah. originally from? Where are you yeah. really from? Yeah. I think oh, this Leeds. Is the thing, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you want to go there, mate? Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
my mum used to say something which I used to kind of cringe at when you're when I was a kid but now I kind of understand it a bit more especially now with whole, you know everything with the Black Lives Matter movement and everything mm. where she was you know she would be like we are never going to be white yeah you know so if somebody was doing something that she, you know and I was like oh you know that's not okay like blah, blah, blah. but now I understand what she meant is like you have mm. to be authentic to who you are there's no yeah, point pretending absolutely. to be this person like you know there's no point kind of anglicizing your name or saying mm-hmm. oh can you not say Bullivin that oh fine fine yeah call me Paul that's fine you know there's like yeah she she my mum would be kind of like quite harsh about that kind of stuff and I used mm. to be like oh mom you need to like chill out be yeah, yeah, yeah. but now I get it because what she's saying is don't shrink yourself mm. you know don't don't kind of make yourself smaller or make yourself seem unimportant in order to make you more palatable yeah, yeah. to other people I think that's a really really strong, 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 message, strong yeah. message and you mentioned goodness gracious me then it's like the, the Coopers on that really nailed that yeah, nailed yeah, that yeah. sentiment really really well <laughs> Well, so yeah, but it's, it's, it happens <laughs> yeah. and, and it, it does happen and I think it still happens and I think it's really mm. important to that people do remember that it, their identity is okay, it's good, you should embrace it and not try and mm. sweep it under the carpet and pretend like, oh, it's not cool or it's not accepted. That's, that's yeah. a, a real like subtle but big issue. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. It's, it's kind of like not as extreme as kind of other issues like I totally get it but I think it's all part of that like you know the fact that we feel like we need to do that I'm sure it's all part of white supremacy you know that's all the the ways that we kind of shrink down and the ways that we're like oh no no I can't be yes you know I should be like the Mm. the, yeah like I need to be like the model immigrant you know we're called like the good immigrants as Asians so yeah so in them early years when you were at school and you started listening to um and exposing yourself to this Britpop kind of music and stuff what what was the first vinyl cd or tape do you remember buying around that time i actually didn't buy because i wasn't given pocket money okay so i didn't i was like did not have i mean i'd have like birthday money and stuff but you know when your mum used to take it from me she'd be yeah. like i'd save it and then you'd never <laughs> bloody see it never again. see it again <laughs> you're spent on raised beds now so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah <exactly. laughs> <laughs> I bet you I'll come to it and you know where, where, if I ever do get married I'll be like where's that money and she'll be like oh you know spent it all on Akka and stuff like she won't <laughs> she won't I don't think she saved it um I'm trying to remember <laughs> trying to remember because obviously it would have been an it was an album I think it was I wonder if it was Cooler Shaker actually oh really I wonder if it was that yeah that bi- I can't remember this, the name of the album Brimful now when it's kind of gone it was the tune was it it was no that was no, that was that Corner, was Corner Shop, Shop that was Corner Shop yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that That's was right, Corner yeah. Shop and this this was um, like they did like they do it's on the it's on the tip of my tongue song. Uh-huh. it's so annoying isn't it uh, Hush Hey something Hush just... Hush yeah. that was it yeah that was it it was that album it was that album and I mean the irony of me listening to some to like white people singing about like using Asian influence yeah, yeah, you know what I mean yeah, it's like yeah. even when I'm like trying to get away from it I'm still li- listening to you know listening to stuff yeah with sitars and mm. stuff like that but I do remember like when I was a teenager getting like the old kind of stereo putting my headphones into the little jack yeah and listening to Bobby Bobby Friction like late at night because okay yeah I'd never heard, I'd, I'd heard of like Punjabi music, mm. you know, I'd heard of like, you know, Mukid Singh and Hida and Alab and stuff. And then I'd yeah. heard of obviously the Britpop side of things. Mm. And then I was like, whoa, this is like Asian, but it's like fusion, but yeah. it's like hip hop. And that, yeah. I was like, what is this? And it like the kind of those sounds of the Asian underground just like blew my mm. mind. That like, for me as well, that, that Radio 1 time when Bobby Friction yeah. was on there and Nahal really opened my mind up to the fact that hang on you can be Asian and do these different sounds yeah. like we spoke about it a couple of weeks ago like with uh, with Caper like Asian Dub Foundation and uh, mm. last week we spoke about um, Nit and Sony and all them guys who were yeah. identify as like our people but yeah. they're doing this completely different sound and for a significant period of time I was listening to that music thinking hang on a sec you don't necessarily need to be a Bhangra DJ because you're yeah. Punjabi, you can do anything else. Yeah, of course. I mean, people obviously will, will try and steer you towards that or try and put you in that yeah. box. But like, how lovely. And I was like, oh, this, I mean, it makes me now want to just like go and listen yeah. to like yeah. an hour of Asian <laughs> Dub Foundation because, you know, I was like, well, what, where's that movement yeah. now? Yeah. No, well, you know, it is, it's I mean, gone I deeper underground. Like, it was underground before, it's gone deeper. Yeah. Now. 
I just, I mean, what, what an ex- I really wish I'd been older at that time because, like, mm. what an exciting yeah. time to mm-hmm. have like gone out and like I would have, I'd love to go out to, I'd say a club, a, no, somewhere quiet where I can just listen <laughs> to it. But like, <laughs> but like when I was younger, I would have loved to have gone out and listened to that for like a solid four or five hours. Yeah, great, like listening to this thing. But yeah, anyway, I think, I I think that's it. A, that's a, it's. A, I kind of look at that time, like you said, around maybe 97 to the early noughties, that that period of time, yeah, you had goodness gracious me. So there was a lot more Asian people on TV and people that we could relate to. And what mm. all of it was satire and it was it was funny and it was comedic. But you kind of thought, bloody hell, that's so true. Like Lino, yeah. that kind of stuff. It's like Lino only existed in Indian yeah. households. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And then obviously, like you say, the kind of music as well. And then I remember... Definitely around that time, the BBC did start doing like the Malay cream of Asian comedy, and mm. that was a, but it was on at like two in the morning, and you had to tape yeah. it. Yeah, because Asians aren't Asians aren't mainstream. But that exactly. was the time where we're like that feels like that was the last time that we were like in fashion because you know yep. Madonna was yeah. wearing a bindi, you know yep. Gwen Stefani was wearing a bindi, the Spice Girls Absolutely. were in, were in India doing something wearing sari tops and salavars which I remember yeah. my mum catching my mum was like I can see them now like she was like what is this like because <laughs> okay. that's such she's a mum like, thing <laughs> <laughs> sari like, hey, bye, uh, <laughs> yeah she's like and so it, it felt like we were kind of in fashion but even then I don't know about how you felt I didn't feel like it was it really spoke to my background as a working class Punjabi British mm. Asian like child of immigrants like it didn't really it was kind of like fun and it was great goodness gracious me it was was fantastic but mm. it feels like what like what's happened yeah. since then like there's there wasn't really yeah, a no. movement well it was just fashion wasn't it i think like yeah, you, uh, at trend. the time at the time like i remember as well it it was dubbed by channel four as the indian summer as well when um yeah. india came over in the bread cricket uh against england and i went to to see it at trent bridge and i was like oh this is so cool they've kind of got this indian theme going and you could identify yeah. with that. And it's cool at the time, but you look back and you kind of think, well, what happened yeah. since then? But also because, like, we're not a trend. Exactly. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? We're not we're a theme. Stay. We're not, you know, yeah. I mean, like, we've yeah. been here for ages. Yeah. We'll continue to be here, you know, despite the Tory party. But, like, you know, we'll continue <laughs> to be here do, doing our thing. So it's like, when you think about it now with, like, your, your 2020 kind of, you know, lens on, mm. it's a bit like, is that a bit offensive? that you thought that we were just like a little flash in the pan. We'll talk about yeah. this for a little bit. Like mm. we're a trend, like right. a fashion, Absolutely. you know, like like along with combat trousers or like yeah. pickers or whatever. It's like, it's like oh well. no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had the fake ones. From the <laughs> um, I, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for hard. Thanks yeah, for hard, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, so, so you know, you're talking about fashion and probably the the – the stuff that you wore in school, what were your school years like? Did you always find yourself to be a performer or the funny one in your friendship group? But was it, was that the kind yeah. of personality that you had? I hated school. Like, let me just start off with that. I loved primary school. I hated secondary school. I felt like I, I was like top of the class in primary school. I went to secondary school and I never quite found my feet. Mm. Like I just kind of felt like that. So when people are like, Oh, school day is the best of your life. I'm like, how depressing mm. is that? You've got the rest of your life yeah, and you think that yeah. that time was, you know, the best. Um, so I was very happy to leave school. But I think, yeah, I think I was, I, I was a very shy child. So mm. I definitely wasn't a performer type. It started coming out kind of in my teen years, I think. I remember making jokes. I don't remember what the jokes were, but I remember people looking at me like, did she just say that? Or like that quiet one, you know, it was like <laughs> the quiet chubby kids with the yeah. nhs glasses and the mustache you know that, <laughs> yeah. that's kind of who i was yeah um and then i kind of, and then i did like a I did drama gcse and then i was like oh like i love this but even then because i'm such an overthinker even then i was like oh i love performing and then i was like oh is it because i'm trying to like run away from who i am like, <laughs> like for god's sake like it's just, <laughs> it's just it's just check off do it yeah. right. um so yeah, I loved I loved drama and I loved English. Like those were my like two loves, and I loved performing in in that aspect. But of course, like I no one no one ever tells you it, c- it can be a career. You know, no one no yeah. one was going oh, especially yeah, in an Indian that. household. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody tells you. No, I was I didn't even 
dream of being a performer as a career mm. like I didn't even dream of it you know and even like in sixth form when all my friends were like um I went to a really academic school which probably in hindsight wasn't the best match for me but um my friends were like yeah I want to be doctors I'm going to go and I'm going to study science at uni and we're going to do this this and this and, and I was like they all had their every single one of them had their part you know mm. whether that was going to uni or whether that was you know doing some other sort of course at a college or whatever I had absolutely no idea yeah. I had zero idea and I felt so I felt like such a weirdo for not knowing mm. like I think I think also because it was only really about six years ago five years ago that I decided what I did want to do <laughs> <laughs> so I was kind of like that's a long time drifting yeah. from like 18 all the way up to 30 just like not really knowing but yeah like I'm not a natural born performer not like a Obviously, my parents didn't take me to stage school on a Saturday. You know, they didn't yeah. take me to jumpy school on a Saturday. <laughs> you know, they didn't. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So I wasn't a, like a traditional kind of performer. You know, like those kids at wed- like at mm. parties. You know, when they're like, ah, oh, play Uncle Nugana or whatever. Yeah. You know, I wasn't like. <laughs> I wasn't that kid. Oh, you, did, you didn't quickly do a skit. You mean a uh, family <laughs> wedding or anything like that? I was always just hiding behind my mum's journey. I was always yeah. like that little kid who was yeah. so scared. <laughs> So around 2002, <laughs> presumably you, you just turned 16, um, mm. you left school and you started training uh, the court theatre company. How was mm. that for you? And I know you talked about just now that it's not, it wasn't really a traditional route. How was that taken and what was your experience at home going into that? I'll keep it really short because, God, there's a whole saga. But it was... <laughs> tough it's tough yeah. like I'm yeah. not gonna lie it's tough you know my parents neither of them were lucky enough to be given much of a formal education mm. so when it came to me they were like we want you to have that we want you to have that we want you to have that. like regardless of whether I wanted it yeah. they wanted me to have that yeah yeah but at the time I was like oh my god the thought of sitting and learning now at a desk for another three years at uni or two years or whatever I can't do it so mm. I kind of got in and then I told them and they all kicked off and it was just like, that was like pretty much the whole of my 20s was just me going, no, I'm going to do this. And my mum going, go work in a bank. And me going, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. And like, you know, and it kind of, you know, it's been a really long journey to get to a place yeah. now where I can truly be like, be like myself with my parents, like we can chill. And I really like, we really appreciate each other. And like the love has always been there. But I think it's been a really, really tough journey for us. And it was literally only... That. this is why when people are like oh my parents are never going to come around to it but you know when I like speak to like younger people like I was 35 when my parents went okay we get it now yeah. literally last year like it was when, a year when ago. your dad probably got a whatsapp message and it was one of your yeah. videos <laughs> that's it oh it. this is what she does it was <laughs> you know what you know what it is it was my chachi who did it because she called up and she was okay. like we actually my chachi from Leeds you know oh, say wow. you know we, we love watching stuff on whatever like you know on youtube or whatever like she's really funny and i'd always kept that kind of side away from my parents because i think i was just a bit like you're not going to approve of it yeah it's just gonna like cause more aggro like why should i even though it's such a huge Mm. part of my life i was like let's just keep it separate because it's just Mm. to be easier that way Mm. um and it was finally last year i was like look it's time to get them to come see a show they came to see a show at my local theater where there's like you know, I live in a very Punjabi area. Yeah. There's like 400 other Punjabis there. There's like half the goddaughters there. My dad mm. knows everyone. Like, yeah. they know everyone. You know, my mum's wearing a best suit, you know, best yeah. footy. Like, she's like, <laughs> you know, doesn't quite get what we're doing. Like, yeah. she was a bit like, you know. What quite, is this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, she was a bit like, and I was like, look, this is what I'm going to do. She was like, Eat? I was like, look, just just watch it. It'll be fine. And, um, and I think because they saw it, they were like, oh, okay. She's not doing anything shameful. She's not doing like... Mm you know she's not embarrassing herself or other people you know she's she's just kind of this is what she does and look at how you know what it is like for our parents you know yeah it's important to them what other people think of you absolutely you know and as soon as they saw that other people were having a positive reaction they were like oh, I they were like fine like you can do this now yeah um so we are you know it, it was tough like you know going to drama school was really tough I didn't have a support network mm. you know I kind of just had to tough it out on my own obviously don't have siblings so I was kind of like I don't know how, like, looking back at it now, I'm like, it's quite a kind of ballsy yeah. thing yeah, to do, sure. to, like, yeah, go yeah. from your tiny little it, house, it really you is. Know. It really is. I mean, some people just, they do the university route, and, like, like myself, yeah. I, did, I did a design degree, and my brother did, like, maths 
and uh, and computer yeah. science and that kind of thing. So to my dad, it was kind of like, mm, what are you going to become from this? Because mm. to them, the sciences is the way forward. So I yeah. thought then I was going to get Spain, but to 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 go to drama school or performing school yeah. and train and drop all of the types of education yeah, is ballsy. And you know, what? I commend you for it. It's and it, it's paying dividends now, which is which is fantastic. But I did I did want to just highlight the the point that you were saying that there's there's a lot of people who do similar things and they have mm. a separate home life to their yeah. school life. And we mm. was talking about it a little bit earlier on. But so when you did go to drama school, did you find that your personality was evolving and your musical personality? Did you start listening to, to different things? Did you start becoming more, much more free in your musical yeah. tastes? Because obviously at home, like you said, you just listen to Geek. I just not. couldn't. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I spent a lot of money, actually. I remember just buying lots of CDs, you know. <laughs> I got really into, like, Jimi Hendrix for, like, a whole six months. Oh, I really? To, like, it's our whole back catalogue, Jimi Hendrix. Um, I think, yeah, I think you kind of... Because I guess I was so young when I went. I was one of the youngest ones there at 18. Everybody else generally goes to drama school. You know, they do the academic thing and they might go, like, in their mid-20s yeah. or, you know, even later. So... I guess for me, my, my personality was developing. I had absolutely no idea who I was, you know. Mm. I, no idea. I didn't have a clue. I was, like, so green. I was, so, I was like, as green as the leaves on the tree. I was, <laughs> like, so naive. So I think, yeah, that was great. The fact that I could, like, now go to gigs, I had, like, the freedom of, like, doing that, of, like, going to gigs and stuff. I went to... My first gig, actually, was to go and see The Thrills. I don't know if you know the band, The Thrills. Yeah. Oh, wow. So they were... I don't think they've done much since but like okay. in the early 2000s they were yeah, like them up. That's, that's when they came up and i used to buy like enemy and stuff and like listen to the white stripes yeah 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 like, yeah that was definitely like the more kind of experimental phase in terms of like also like how i dress and the music i love to listen to and mm. all sorts of things so yeah that was a fun time so that the, the, it really sounds like the the kind of music you listened to there helped shape your personality almost as well or was mm. it the fact that people that you were around helped shape that personality and you were influenced by by them yeah i think definitely the latter because again drama school all white you know i think that i was one of like three or four non-white students Mm -hmm. there and i think now it's very different like drama schools are a bit more diverse although diversity in drama schools is a huge issue but like then I guess, again, I was really rejecting that Punjabi side, the really rejecting that side of my culture without realising it. Yeah, yeah. I am doing Shakespeare and it's like Stanislavski and it's all of it's theatre and it's all of this and that's the stuff that's taught to you and that's the stuff that you kind of like get into. When I graduated from drama school, then I was like going up for parts and stuff and you just realise that I'm all I'm going to be seen as is Asian woman, you know, or yeah, junior yeah. doctor or, you know terrorist wife or you know (laughs) that's that's kind of that's and I didn't even fit in there because they were like oh you're kind of like you know in my early 20s and they were like oh you know you kind of have to either be that kind of whole Bollywood extremely glamorous look yeah or you have to be like a lot older so even then and that's one of the reasons why I stopped doing acting in my early 20s was Mm. because I was like I there's no room for me in this industry I don't fit in yeah anywhere well, that, that, that was actually going to be my next question. I, I saw that there there was a gap of five or six years after yeah. uh, you were seven training. Years. Yes, yeah. so it's, yeah. as, as long as seven years. Um, mm. But then you did go back to uni, didn't you? And you did event management. So yeah. was, that, was that the kind of thing that you <laughs> thought, hang on a sec, I don't fit in any of these boxes, so let me just try something else? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think I was like 23 when I did my last acting job. It wasn't really getting anywhere. I was... In hindsight, I wasn't very well, like, mental health-wise. I think, obviously, mm. at the time, I didn't realise it. But yep. looking back at it now, I'm like, I don't even know how I got through that time. But, like, mm. I then was, like, working in a school, doing, um, supporting children with learning disabilities and stuff. So, which I loved. I loved doing that job. You know, mm. I really enjoyed it. And, so um, and yeah, incredibly. Uh, not financially. But, like, you <laughs> know, in <laughs> so many other ways. Um, and I just thought, I have to go to uni now. I don't know where, I just got it into my head. I was like, I have to go to uni. And it's one of those things, or one of those people, if I get something in my head, I have to do it. Yeah. And then I did it. I hated it. Hated it every second of it. I made two very good friends out of it. So that's kind of worth it. But, uh, you know. <laughs> that's worth no, it. It's fees. really worth it. If they, yeah, that's <laughs> worth it. I mean, and I got in 
that was the year before the fees just like rocketed. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, it was actually quite good timing. So thank you, God, for saving me from that one. <laughs> uh, but I hated it. I hated it. I came out with like, I don't even know what I got to, one, two, two. Like I hate, I hardly ever went. Yeah. I was just, I was just a bit kind of like in my late twenties, everybody else is doing their own thing. And I was like, what am I doing? Doing yeah, a degree that yeah. I don't even really like, you know, my mum loved it. Mum came to the graduation. She cried when she saw me in my cap and gown. Mm. So I was like, Jolo, fine. Yeah. She's got that. Yeah. You know, that's yeah, all she's yeah, ever yeah, really yeah. wanted. The picture's to on the mantle right. and that's it now. Yeah, yeah. it's there, mate. It's yeah. there, honestly. And she, <laughs> she takes it. She took it out. Oh my God. I'm going to tell you this really quickly. Basically, I don't know where we'd put it. We're having some work done to the house, of course. Last year, we had a porch built because um, we don't have enough room. There's three of us. Like, how much room do we need? Well, my mum wants someone English to love put the porch, so they can put the I shoes know, there it? and that shoes. kind of stuff. Yeah, put, put your shoes there. Um, so, <laughs> someone to put all your chopper on. Yeah, got. exactly. So, basically, the builder was like, "Oh, like I notice you've got a, a daughter, like uh, you know," and she was like, "Yeah, yeah," and she's not married. And he was like, "Oh, you know, I know of a few people." And she took that photo is in a massive like frame. It's like a huge one of just like me on my own, with, you know, the yeah. little fake degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I came downstairs and it's right in the middle of the living room <laughs> because she knew that the builder was going to come back with like potential like rush stuff for me. So yeah. she's like, she's just kept it right there. And I was like, okay. Thanks. <laughs> That's a different kind of showcase that you're used to. <laughs> Isn't it? I was like, what, what are you doing? I mean, nothing ever happened. I'm still here. Still here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, look, that, that, was a, that was a good time. And also like in terms of performance, just to link it back to like when we talk about music, hmm. it's, it's, it's not just talking randomly <laughs> about my life. But um, I always, if I'm doing a show, I hmm. always have a soundtrack. So if I'm doing a play or um, I'll always have a soundtrack. And then hmm. before my tour, I always listen to like a certain song. So. Okay. Is it, does that kind of get you in a, a certain kind of mindset then? It, so you put that tune to that particular tour and that is almost your theme. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And if it's if it's a play that I'm doing or a film or whatever, then it's um to do with character. Yeah. To kind of get me, it's just a way to like get into character. Mm. And then if it's my tour, then it's just to kind of get me revved up and kind of feeling quite good and like confident and positive, you know, yeah. uh, regardless of like what's happened during the day to kind of just get into the zone. So. so so when you was doing the the teaching and the social care, which you said you you were enjoyed so much, mm. were you kind of still eyeing up the performing arts side of things, looking at what opportunities were there, maybe going to the odd audition, that kind of thing. No. Oh, you, so it was Literally like nothing. Behind. Wow. Yeah. Honestly, I totally, I closed the door from it. I was like, that part of my life is over. It's time to grow up. Like that, wow. I just totally closed the door on it. I 100% never thought that I would be doing what I'm doing now. I genuinely was like, you've done that. You've tried it. It wasn't for you. It didn't work out. Okay, cool. You gave it your best shot um mm. that's fine I, and I you know in that time I didn't even go to the theater that much I wasn't even like really into films a lot of and it was easier then because a lot of my friends that I'd gone to drama school with were all mm. like you know buying houses getting married starting babies so they weren't doing yeah. it either so a lot of people had left so I wasn't really around creative right. people in that sense mm. um but yeah and I but I also for like a number of reasons just wasn't very happy either yeah like you know, just not very satisfied you know yeah, when you're kind of like I'm just, that's just something yeah, yeah. that's exactly what it was and that's, it, what, I, that's what I've thing always felt with with us as well um m- myself and Mac we were on the the DJ circuit for a number of years and then it got to around 2003 and certain things were happening in my life that I ended up leaving it behind a little bit and it became more of a, a hobby um yeah. I, I met my wife and I, I decided to spend more time with her uh and once you stop doing gigs people stop calling you back and start yep. uh, start booking you and stuff like that. And But then I, I found for a period from 2003 up until this year that I, I fell out of love with music a little bit as well, uh, which is really funny because I've always loved the art of DJing and everything got to do with DJing. But I fell out of love with music because I, was, I just wasn't listening to the crap that was coming out. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I was still kind of nostalgic about the old stuff. And I like that, mm. but but nothing reignited that flame inside uh, inside for for music again. And it, it's funny that I can almost relate to that kind of thing where you you said you wasn't even going to the theater and you yeah. wasn't even yeah. watching movies because you can't 
kind of felt like you just left it behind. Yeah. And it's not like I was going, oh, I wish I was doing this or, oh, I wish I was, yeah. you know, it's not like I was watching stuff going, oh, I could play that part or I mm. could do that. I, there was nothing of that in me at all. Mm. Like at all. It was just, it yeah. was a proper break. You yeah. know, it's a proper, like, it was yeah. like a break up really. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, yeah. and I've was, done you the world. Like when not... you think back it, about it now, like sometimes that complete break from yeah. something and not the, break where it's like oh I really want to do it but I'm just not doing it just a complete break it kind of refreshes, yeah. you, refreshes you and recharges your battery so when you do go back into it go back fresh mm. you're completely fresh absolutely yeah absolutely like yeah. it gives you perspective as well you know mm. because I think for so long ever since I was younger I've always known that I was like a mm. little bit different you know I've mm. never really like wanted to go you know unlike the Punjabi girls I grew up with I never wanted to like go become a doctor or become a lawyer or whatever you yeah. know I never wanted to do that I never wanted to get married young and have kids and have a big house with the mm. black and gold gates with the lions on them I was like that's not <laughs> like no, I will, I will, I, it's not <laughs> picking fences it's fucking no, like you know it but I never wanted that so I didn't know what I wanted but I yeah. knew what I didn't want and what yeah. I didn't want was to like live in that live yeah. that kind of life sometimes that's more important isn't it to know what you don't want as opposed yeah. to what you do want yeah yeah it's like a Definitely. process of elimination you kind of yeah, go well i don't yeah. want that and this is going to lead me there but i think i had a stigma about myself throughout all of that because i was like why can't you be normal like your life would be so much easier if you had yeah. no ambition like your life would be so much easier that's if you only just the perceived like... normal though it's not actually normal yeah you know what i mean it's... absolutely absolutely and it's like something that i have to catch myself yeah. doing now when i'm like especially like around my birthday and stuff, I'm always a bit like, oh, you should have got this. And I was like, hold on, right. where is that coming from? Like, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. re- I don't really think that. That's just an idea that I've been that's, conditioned that's to That's exactly think. it. Absolutely. That's exactly it. It. Because it's like we're, when we were talking mm. earlier about, you know, pushing our culture away, we also, our culture does mm. at the same time put a lot of pressure on us to do certain things by certain times and in a certain way that if you don't do it, you're made to feel like you're yeah. not normal. Yeah, or yeah, you failed yeah. in some way, or yeah, you know, or right. you're not good enough in some way. And I think, and that's the kind of downside yeah. of that kind of pressure that you feel when you're part of like such a tight knit community, isn't mm, it? That, that kind of like that comparison thing, you know, being compared constantly to other people. And then we grow up and we're yeah. comparing. You know, I was kind of thinking about it recently. I was like, why do I compare? And I was like, that's, because literally, as far back I can you. remember, my mom's going, that's what I mean, yeah, you, yeah. You know, even as little kids, you know, when your mum would yeah. be like, look yeah, at him yeah. or look at her, look at what they're doing, yeah, you know. <laughs> Within the same household, it was me and my brother. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So in 2011, then something must have clicked because then you featured in a movie, Terry, uh, as Mrs. Sanger. Oh, yeah. So basically that was somebody that I went to drama school with, Nick, okay. who I went to drama school with, yeah. made, this, uh, made this thing. And do you know what? The joy about doing that was there was no script oh brilliant so my performance there was there was a script no oh my god but like I, my part was completely um i improvised wow that, that's, that's amazing that's what it was and, he, and he and also and also because he was like he was like i've just found out jay sean's real name can we call <laughs> you camel jay <laughs> <laughs> I was like yeah you can you can but I remember watching that back and going oh like very kind of like a very small part of me was like oh I can I've never done screen acting before and actually mm. that wasn't bad like I'm kind of going oh I can actually do that um but it's great because there's no pressure because it wasn't my career it was just yeah. like a day a fun, yeah. you know it was like it was like a, a Saturday when I was like cool uh, I've done that I've done a bit of acting but even then I wasn't like no 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 because obviously the industry is very different from the mm. art. Like, you, yeah. yeah, you know that. Mm. You know, you might enjoy DJing, but the industry is never... It's completely different. Great. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what we did. We actually didn't like much, to be honest. It was the yeah. the politics yeah. of it and having to having to speak to the right people and do all the right mm. things to, in order. Like, I love the art. And this is the reason why we kind of did the podcast, because it's something we can control. We're not mm. going by an industry almost yeah. you know what i mean Where, whereas trying to make it big as a dj you end up having to to sell a bit of your soul really to yeah of course to get to get to it so that's why we wanted to to kind of do something like this um mm. and it, it's crazy how that that journey of our musical journey kind of parallels and, and resonates within the arts as well in terms mm. of performing arts um which i, I find really really interesting but then obviously after, like you said, this was just a cameo in 
2011, yeah. just a, a one-off shot kind of thing. But did it kind of reignite some sort of passion? Because then a few years later, you ended up on the comedy circuit. So how did that come about? What was that journey of that three years? Well, basically, I turned 30 and I was walking home with a friend. And I was just at that time where, you know, obviously you turn 30, you have like all these different ideas in your head about what 30 looks like. And, you, mm. you know, you look at all your friends and you're like, oh, my God, what am I doing? And, yeah. you know, and it's a new decade, you know, and it feels like, OK, now's the decade where I have to make something happen because it feels like your 20s, you're just kind of like growing up. Yeah, yeah. And I very clearly and strongly felt that at the time. I felt like I'd wasted my 20s because I was like, mm. you were just drifting. You didn't really set a goal. You didn't really do anything. You know, you were just kind of like, oh, I want to do it. Oh, I don't want to do it. Oh, I love it. Oh, I don't love it. Oh, there's no place for me in this business, whatever. Mm. And I remember walking home after celebrating my 30th and I was walking home with a friend and I just went, I'm, I want to give acting another go. And it came out of nowhere. And she yeah. was like, I think, she was like, I think you're mad. Like, why would you want to do that? Like, you know, you want something with a bit of security, stability, like you're 30 now. And I was like, I said, I just want to do it for a year, which is madness because it takes, you know, that, that famous quote, I think it's, I think it might be like De Niro who said that it takes 10 years to become an overnight sensation. Yeah, yeah. Like, wow. you know, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Even, like saying like a year is nothing in terms of the industry yeah. and, and like in terms of like building your profile and stuff. I was like, just, I said, I'm just going to give myself a year. I'm just going to give myself a year. And then I like applied for this thing called monologue slam where you pick a monologue or you write a monologue and it's a competition loads of industry come and watch you 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 have an audience yeah. as well but there's like a industry panel and loads of agents and you know managers and whatever like people come and see you mm. and a friend was my friend was like you should do it you should do it you should do it and I was like oh I don't I, I was looking through like books of monologues you know speeches for women you know like yeah. going into libraries going into the national theater going into like going on google and I was like they're just not really for me like there's nothing here that really speaks to me so I wrote a monologue um about uh, a woman who's from Bradford <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. enough, um, on her wedding day and uh, she's giving a speech at the reception and uh, she just she's she's just kind of like been given this mic and she's like oh all right I'll, uh, I'll better say something then like you know she she's kind of <laughs> she's just like she's a bit of, she's a bit of an idiot you know she's a bit of a boundary but you love her <laughs> yeah. and um and I went <laughs> and I went along and I wore like a full white dress you know back when there used to be that uh kind of real trend for Punjabi brides to wear like the traditional Punjabi red and then for reception wear white like yeah, yeah, white, yeah. like yeah. you know more kind of English dress and I bought, bought this like really cheap kind of long white dress with a little veil and I like you know and I did this speech to you know it must have been like it was a full house so it was like five six hundred people wow and I was thinking about it the other day funnily enough and it was honestly one of the best nights of my life because really? I was up there and I was yeah. saying my own words and nobody was telling me what to say and the audience reaction was amazing and it was like I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it because a live before you know there's that live energy that you just don't get Definitely. you know which is why I, ha I haven't been doing like comedy gigs online people are like oh, I'll do it online I'm like yeah, what to yeah, a screen awful, yeah awful. you know it's like that's that's not that's not why I do it that's not why I you do need it. that so, feedback from the audience don't you yeah, and that's what and you like, buzz that, off of it, absolutely you feed off of that right yeah. uh, and I won the competition Wow. And I got my agent and this was all within three months wow. deciding that I was going to do speed. it. Brilliant. And it, but, you know, and it feels to me like it, every, it yeah. just felt like divine timing. It felt like the universe, God, whatever, yes. was like, you made, you said it, I'm making it happen. Now you need to grab it. And instantly, like I got like my first TV job. I was in Black, you know, I did Black Mirror. Yeah. All of these things started happening, I think, as soon as just life in it you get out of your own way and stuff starts happening I think yeah. when a lot of the time we're always going oh I shouldn't be doing oh should I be doing that and actually here it here it is and it was what like it was wonderful but I still didn't want to do stand-up then <laughs> <laughs> no because I think I think you did Black Mirror <laughs> was it like 2012 you you featured yeah. in, in Black Mirror so shortly after like you said you did the the monologue Sam so following yeah. on from from all of this you it you create really took off then and you became a, a regular on BBC Asia Network's comedy shows then, um, mm, 2014 mm. onwards kind of thing. Mm. And um, as well as with other comedy promoters and your face was regularly on TV, you featured on EastEnders. And and yeah. then you were in Victorian Abdul alongside the legend yeah. that is uh, Dame Judi Dench. 
Um, oh that must yeah. have been one hell of an experience as well. And like you said, that was just not long weird. after thinking, oh, okay, I'm going to pick this acting thing back up. Yeah. Literally, that was a uh, film set in 2016. So mm. like four years later, or less than four years later, I'm, you know, just like on set with, with you know, Judy Dench on the Isle of Wight, just doing this thing. And I was like, it's mad, isn't it? It's mad. And I still, I think at that time, since then I've done a lot more, I've got a bit more experience on like TV and screen and things. So yeah. I know a bit more, but it's terrifying because you learn by doing it. Mm. No one can teach you how to do screen acting. Like they can teach you, they can teach you that. Mm. But until you're there in that environment and you're kind of going, I'm quite an anxious person anyway. So mm. I'm there like trying to like calm my nerves. Judy Dench is there, you know, all sorts of other like famous like actors that I've seen, you know, the cameras, the lights, the directors there. And I'm just like, oh, like the, the whole of that job was just me like... <laughs> <laughs> just like this the whole time just being like just be like just get through just don't get through just don't get fired just don't get fired but you know and I think it, it was such yeah. a dream of a job it was such yeah. fun to do it was such a dream and I met Eddie Izzard on that job oh wow and somebody had told him that I did stand up and I was like <laughs> why would you tell why <laughs> why I mean That's yeah, like he's me a legend in stand up himself you know what I, mean? and, yeah. I was like don't don't tell him in that you know we're, we're in this scene and I'm like in a full vodka and everything and we're just like <laughs> in between shots and and he turns and he says somebody tells me that uh you do stand up and I was like I told him that <laughs> I was livid. but um but yeah he's definitely like one of my com like one of my comedy heroes but even then I you know to me it's like stand up, I, like I said, I kind of fell into it by accident because I love live performance, you know, and yeah. like, the, like it's why I love theatre so much. But it was never like that was never the plan. But the irony is, I was always like, no, I'm an actress first. A bit snobby. I was a bit snobby about it. I was like, no, yeah. no, no, I'm an actress first, and then I'm a comedian. And then the irony is that that has been my bread and butter yeah. for like, yeah. you know, three years or whatever. Like that, I've done way more comedy than I've done acting, mm. and that is that's how I got my book deal. Because wow. somebody had seen my yeah, show, yeah. like yeah. this editor had seen my show and gone, oh, you can write, because obviously you've written your own material. She's like, you yeah. can write, like write a book with us. Mm. Um, so it's all kind of worked out, wow. worked out really well, even though I now throughout the, this podcast, I realized how many signs <laughs> I missed along the way that like right. live yeah. performance was my calling. Now I'm like, you just a little bit sick. Like, you know, <laughs> well, you got there in the end and not only did you get there, you're, you're smashing it now, which is yeah. such a great story to hear. Thank you. It, yeah, Thank I mean, you so much. the 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 crazy thing is, is like you said, it wasn't your or what you saw as your primary comedy mm. was, but it's actually turned into that. And I just want to touch on the platforms as well. I mean, obviously, you you did Edinburgh Fringe last year, um, yeah. but what's what's interesting is the BBC Asia Network has been underlying throughout your comedic journey. Yeah. I mean the road shows that you've you've done with them was that how did it feel to be well associated with them i mean obviously being let's be honest they they are a bit of a of a voice um yeah. musically and comedically as well for a lot of people in the country how was it being associated with them and did you kind of feel as if you were meeting dj's and hosts and stuff that you kind of been listening to and that kind of thing what was what was your experience with that so basically I I think it was like a very early on. I think mm. it was like my fifth or sixth gig. And I it was at my local theatre and I did it. And I met the comedian Sindhu V. Okay, yeah. And um she I've never met her before. I'm five foot nothing. She's like almost six foot and like so imposing and like in heels <laughs> and like looks like you know, she's just like really confident, like with her perfect hair. And uh, and I also like, I knew of her work and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm on the same bill as in Duvi. Like I'm just a baby at this. And and uh, I came off stage and she was like, here you, give me your email like this. And I was like, <laughs> what? Give, give, give me your email like this. And I was like, oh, yeah, have it, have everything. I'm like, put my money, like, <laughs> like take everything. It's so phone. scary. <laughs> yeah, take it, take it. Like, um, and she basically... I didn't even know why, because I was too scared to question her why she wanted it. She basically got in touch with the Asian network and was like, you need to book this girl onto your comedy shows. Brilliant. And they called me up. <laughs> I lied. They know about this now, so I can tell you. But they called me up and they were like, so how long have you been doing comedy? I was like, yeah, you know, three or four years. <laughs> <laughs> 
I've only been doing it for four <laughs> years now. Uh, <laughs> I said, like, yeah, three, four years, yeah. yeah. I've been and telling I jokes my whole life, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. I said, like, yeah, you know, and obviously I've got a background in performing, you know, which I, I basically just BSed my way to yeah, the yeah. phone call. Oh, send us send us a clip. And I was like, I had this really bad, grainy clip that somebody had like videoed when I was on stage. And I sent it. I was like, this is not gonna happen. This is not gonna happen. I called up and they were like, Yeah, we want you. And that was the first time that I did it back in 2017. And after I did it and it went really well, <laughs> I remember going up to one of the one of the producers and being like, just so you know, that was my seventh gig. <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> I was like I feel really bad I've lied to you I've lied to you that was like you your camera up. yeah yeah yeah, it, yeah. It, I felt really because I was like I've smashed it now <laughs> so it's fine um I thought I smashed it at the time I look back at it now and it's like that's the downside of like having like a very public and gig yeah, like that yeah early yeah. on is you yeah. look back at it and I was like oh what are you doing what are you wearing we should have got someone to do your hair like you should have mm. you know you should have done this or you should have you know you could have developed that joke whatever but do you know what they the, the fact that they called me back and obviously that um from last year um that clip went viral which i so weird to me i don't even know how things go viral the only way i yeah. found out was because my, my mate instagrammed me going why is my mum showing me you on whatsapp she's like uh, wow <laughs> she's like my mum's just like no watch her watch her and she's like yeah i know that's me like <laughs> that's um, brilliant so yeah it, it, like, eternally grateful to Cindy V and eternally grateful to the Asian Network because it's on it's really you know it's really it's such a huge step in my career yeah I, and the thing is you look at the build and like you say you're all mm. you've only really been doing uh, stand-up and comedy for three or four years um mm. but you look at the bills of the people that are on these shows like your, your Sonia Mirzas and 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 yeah. people like they've been in the game for years. And for you to be alongside that, it's a real. It, yeah, but it's a, it's a it's a real real compliment to to you and and your craft. The fact that you're on oh, on the same you. lineups as them and long may it continue thank as you. well. Thank and, you so much. You're really making me want to do it now. I'm like maybe I could do comedy. I really want to do. <laughs> but the the thing is as well. I I, I think with. With the viral videos and stuff, I think the reason why they they went viral and, and as big as they did was because your comedy is so relatable. It's true, isn't it? The best and comedy is the things that people... Yeah. It, it happens to them. And you, yeah, the, Either are afraid to, to say you it. Yeah, it yeah. You, know, you know it's yeah. true. And the, yeah. best, the best comedy always touches that nerve and makes you really think, oh, yeah, that, is, that happens to me every single day of my life too. Yeah. Like, my, my, my wife absolutely loves you, right? And... When I, oh. when I said to her, I said, oh, yeah, I'm getting suck odds on the password. She goes, the one that's in a house share with her mum and dad. I was like, yeah. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's the thing. So that's an association now that people have because of this viral association. And yeah. it's a credit to your writing as well. It's the things that people aren't saying that want to say that kind of thing. It's, oh, it's that, a little bit it's funny. That as well. And actually, I, I really yeah. think um, Thank you. what I love about it is that, you know, we're talking a bit before about feeling accepted in society and that kind of thing. And it's like, if we can laugh at these things or if we can just see them in a different way, it's like, oh, I don't feel yeah. so bad about it now because it's, I can see the funny side yeah, and, yeah. and it mm. makes me feel like more accepting of myself because it's like, it's not just me that's going through this. That's such a huge point. Yeah. I think the thing is growing up as somebody who felt really lonely, when somebody says, oh, I feel really seen mm. by that or I feel like I can really relate to that or that makes me feel like I can accept, that's such the biggest compliment to me because... Mm. We grew up not seeing many Asian people, especially not many seeing many Asian comedians that we can relate to on screen. So to now be in that position for other people just seems like such an honor because it's yeah. like, that's so lovely. And also because I very, I use Punjabi in my set. I'm very, yeah. I'm now very proud of being Punjabi or very, Absolutely. very proud of my roots, you know, very proud of my culture and my heritage. And so now I use Punjabi and like, you know, my director, who's not Punjabi, who is Asian, Taima, it was so important to me to yeah. work with an Asian woman as a director mm. for my for my so solo for my yeah. tour. Yeah. Because I was like, so you get it. Because I was like, if I'm working with somebody who's not Asian or with someone who's white, then I'm gonna be going, um, yeah, no, so Akta is um it's like yeah, the flower yeah. that we like yeah, make yeah. chapatis from. Yeah. You know, it's like I don't wanna waste my time doing that. Whereas, you know, I remember there was a bit where I was talking about the Gordwara and I added in saying, Oh, that's the secret place of worship. She said, Don't add it in, they should know what a Gordwara is. And I was like, oh, you're, there were so many other points of this. Absolutely. where she was like, don't, you're apologizing. Yeah. Don't apologize. 
for that. But I, I remember, know. I remember seeing that, and you, and you actually said the Gurdwara. You didn't say the Sikh temple or anything like. And yeah. that automatically ma- made me weirdly feel a little bit close to you in that in that particular mm. moment, and 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 more relatable. And I, I think I think that's the reason why your your tours have been so successful as well. I mean, mm. you did for Suck's sake was your first yeah. one, and yeah. and then obviously postponed because of covid you've had um life sucks, life sucks. um yeah. which 100 yeah. percent i, I want to go and see uh, when it, i mean when it i was to gonna leads, say when it's back in when it's back in leeds it's now looking like probably gonna be next year now i yeah. think because we're just moving things and that's yeah. fine i think you know i had a bit of a kind of thing about oh no no one's gonna cut people are gonna forget about the tour they're gonna forget mm. that like they've got tickets or they're gonna forget about it but then i was like you know what it is what it is it i is. want people to feel yeah. When people come to a show that I'm either I'm hosting or where where it is my show, I want you to feel like like it's yeah. like a home away from home. Yeah. Like I want you to feel like you're kind of coming into my home and I want to take care of you. I don't I'm not a big fan of going to comedy clubs where people are scared to sit in the front because they're gonna get picked on or like mm, it's that yeah. kind of weird, edgy atmosphere. Like to yeah. me, it's like you've paid good money to come and see it. You know, you've got a babysitter, you've got, you yeah. know, you've yeah. driven here, you've exactly. paid here, you know, whatever. You know, so like I want everybody to have a really, really good experience. That's so like important to me that everybody mm. enjoys it. So when I'm in Leeds, I'll um I'll sort you guys out with tickets. That'd be oh, thank you. That would be that would be great. I would uh, yeah, proper yeah. fanboying yeah. up there. Yeah. I'm like, she's the one. She's the one. <laughs> <laughs> We're just standing the entire time, John. No, it's, it's, all the way through it. It's, Yes. Yeah, wow. Yeah, are you listening to this? Are you listening to this? You just I've never on... said anything. <laughs> Bomb bombs, everything, full work. Put your phone away. Wow. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I just want to go back to to you saying that on each tour or each show, you can you've always had this musical theme. Do you recall any of them for like for for Suck's sake or what? What was the one that you're potentially going to do for Life Sucks? Uh, so for six sake, my show was about mental health mm. and about taking ayahuasca, which is a um like plant medicine yeah, from South yeah. America. I don't know if you've crazy, heard about it. Like, yeah, like psychedelic. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's mad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's mad. It changed my life. But that's that's another yeah. podcast where we talk about you know <laughs> non traditional methods of curing depression. But um, so I used to listen to like ayahuasca music, like mm. the music that I play while during the ceremonies. So I used to listen to that to like get me into it and to feel me like feel connected to that. For for six sake, I uh, for sorry for life sucks. We had a um, a mix that we played like pre show, um, which was a mix of like nineties, which was actually Tommy Sandu came to see the show. Okay, yeah, in, Bir- in Birmingham, and that was like the second ever show. And you know what he's like? He's like Benny. I loved it. I've got to go. Like Benny, I've got to go. I've got to go. Go go see, go go see the in laws. And I was like, okay, all right. He was like. I loved it. Just let's just change up that music. I'll send you a mix. I'll send you a mix. Just do it. You know, so yeah. we've got like a mix that he sent me, which is perfect because it's like '90s Bangla Bollywood, um, bit of R&B and hip hop. I was like, perfect. You know, it's my era. And then for pre-show, I made a list like some Nicki Minaj, some Beyonce, some mm. there. So, so there's like songs that I listen there that are kind of mainly women. Yeah, that I listen to. And then if I'm feeling like really a bit like oh, I don't feel great, or I'm, like, maybe getting a bit anxious or a bit nervous, then I'll listen to, like, Sidhu Musiara or something like that to get me a bit, like... Get real grimy. Yeah, 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 yeah. to to be like, yeah, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So that's what I use. That's what I use before I go on. And I have to, and I think for me, it's like, it becomes a ritual, so I have to listen to it, so I'm like, no one disturb me, Mm. like, at this between this time and this time, because that's what I'm listening to. Yeah. I think think that's really important as well to have almost a ritual as well to get your mindset yeah. absolutely right. And, and music is the best way of doing that. It can put you absolutely. in a completely different state of mind and in and a different place and focus you at the same time. That's, mm. I, I'm, a, I'm a massive fan of that. And, and now, of course, is the big book deal. That's amazing. We obviously <gasps> touched on it in the beginning, but wow, this yeah. I, I'm really looking forward to that as well, especially you saying it's uh. going to be a little bit different as well so um yeah what, what's the team gonna, of that then so basically i can't tell you much about it because it's not been officially officially announced it's gonna be a press release and stuff okay. uh, it's fiction uh so it is made up it'll probably be like it's kind of like loosely based on my life and stuff mm-hmm. it's about a punjabi woman mm-hmm. like me and it's set now so it's modern okay um and so 
I definitely, I was one of the conversations I had with my editor right at the beginning before the book, did, before we, before I'd signed anything, before I'd even written a word of it, was I was just like, I want it to be authentic. I want it to be real. I don't want to shy away from it. Yeah. I want all the words. I want the Punjabi words in there. Even if you had to put like a little glossary of words, yeah, in the back, yeah, I yeah. don't care. You know, I don't want to talk about a box of mangoes. I want to talk about 50 yeah. of mangoes. Like yeah, I want, yeah. like, I want that richness and that fullness because I, you know, I'm a big reader and I grew up reading a lot and, you know, I really wish I'd now had something that somebody had written who's from my background that I could relate to. Because I remember finding those books in the library and they were like gold. Mm. They were like, but yeah. they were always set in like a corner shop or a yeah. sari shop or whatever. <laughs> and it's yeah, like, yeah. That, that's great. Or it's about partition. That's great. And that's an important story to tell. But I swear to God, if I never hear, if I never read another novel about partition, it'll be, I'll be fine. <laughs> I'll live. But <laughs> so I, I guess, I guess I wanted something that's very, very now and yeah. very current that a lot of people, regardless yeah. of their background, can relate to. But obviously, if you are Punjabi, you're going to get something slightly different out of it. It's all about yeah. levels and about the layers mm. of things, isn't it? Absolutely. And I, I think you're right. You're right in the fact that. Yes, there was people before like Gurinder Chadha and, and, and people like mm. that who were doing the writing and that kind of stuff. But I personally could never really relate to her story. So I never really got into mm. them that much. Mm. And she's a fantastic director and she's done great things. Yeah. But I could never really relate on that level. So hence why mm. I'm looking forward to this so much because it's probably, I'm not a massive reader, I'll be honest. But yeah. if something captivates me and I can relate to it, um, I, I will definitely spend the time to reading that. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to that and good luck yeah. with, with it. Thank you very much. Thank ah. you. So nice to talk about yeah, it, even though I can't tell you anything yeah, about it. It's really, really nice good, to like... So we'll, we'll go with that for it. We'll go with that <laughs> yeah. for the rest of the results. <laughs> not one Pete. Not two Pete. It's the three Pete. Okay, so, so this is the part of the show where we ask you the three Pete. Uh, three songs that you could listen to over and over again. It can be absolutely anything, whether you listen to it in the shower or before your shows, like you said, to get you in the right frame of mind. Absolutely anything you want. Uh, what is your number one? And it doesn't oh, have to be so in rank hard. order. Just your first. Oh, it doesn't have to be in rank order. No. Okay, brilliant. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Jagdar Dasu then by Kazuma. An absolute classic. That <laughs> Thank is you. Raw. I'm such a tearjerker, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? It's so Ah, well. it is, like he, 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 he had a real real talent for storytelling within his songs yeah, like with yeah. Mirza and all that kind of stuff as well it was mm. the stories that have long continued as well yeah. what what a song so what what kind of um, nostalgic memories do you have about this one I think this is a song that I listen to when <laughs> I've, I've listened to this a lot when I feel a bit unconnected from my roots Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes. So that always kind of brings me back to that real story, like really rich Punjabi storytelling mm. tradition. Uh, and his voice is incredible. I could have picked any one of his songs, but I yeah. wanted to choose this one because it's such a, a wonderful Beautiful. story behind it. Absolutely. And yeah, like I said, he was, he was a fantastic storyteller. Um, and any, any one of his tunes really, uh, yeah. I think could fit the bill, definitely. Okay. So what is your second of the three feet? Uh, I've chosen Geet Danda Guldasta by Sajid Bindrakia. Again, Wicked. if I could listen to any one artist for the rest of my life, it would be this guy. Really? Like, such an incredible, incredible voice. I loved him. I didn't want to choose, like, you know, the usual... Yeah, stuff like yeah, that. yeah, so I was yeah, like, yeah. We've heard that a lot. And the reason I picked this is because I went through a phase of just Googling really old performances of his. Yeah. Like, just going onto YouTube and yeah, stuff, yeah. like, looking at really... And there's a beautiful live performance, which I don't think has been recorded because I couldn't mm. find it anywhere else. But there's a beautiful, if you just put in like the Beast and the live performance, young yeah. or rare, yeah. it will come up and he's got the full gear on and there's Pongra dancers and it is just beautiful. Like, really? it's like with a live oh, audience and the Definitely. audience is going mad. Like, I sent you the link. Like, it is <laughs> just so, it just brings me out in goosebumps every single time. I think it's, it's great really that you haven't, you haven't picked like, like you said, the common ones, or let the more common ones, like the Riyar Bolda or the Bata and the Bata Tera Satranga. Because, and I think this one is one that I almost forgot 
I mean, I listened to it and I was like, what a tune straight away. But <laughs> it's one that, hang on a second, I, I totally forgot that. I would have probably said that he arbled out or something it's like nice that. that's yeah, not the yeah, kind yeah. of cliche I think that's the really brought from these artists. It's the ones that yeah. are, you know, that's just it. as powerful exactly. in their own right, but sometimes don't get the attention that they deserve. So, so we had your first two on the three P. Guldeep Manik was your first, Sujit Bindrakia being the second. I think I know what your third is going to be, but why don't you tell us what uh, what it is? <laughs> uh, it's cooler shaker. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> it is um, Miradish Dil Naranda um, by the last man. I think I've said it in the right order. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I love this song. You know, I, this is one of the very few Punjabi films that we could watch that weren't complete rubbish yeah. or, you know, just awfully done was Uchadar Babinanika, which is like the film, you know, I could Such quote from that from like when I was film, about three yeah, years yeah. old. And it's incredible and just like really raw in its purity mm. and its innocence and it, and it actually touches on like a lot of really interesting issues as well, yeah. you know, and for that time, it's just really wonderful and what an amazing cast as mm. well. Um, yeah, and I love this song. Again, this is a bit of a tearjerker for me as well and I think you know, talking about Punjab and talking, you know, I'm very passionate about Punjab and like kind of conserving Punjabi culture as well. And also now looking at the destruction of in Punjab as mm. well, of like drugs and like, you know, farmer suicide, all of that kind of stuff. And this just kind of takes me back to a, a slightly happier yeah. kind of time in Punjab was like really thriving mm. and, you know, and, and the song itself talks about the really rich history of, of Punjab as well. And again, again, I think I just like stories, you know, so I, <laughs> yeah, again, it's yeah. another story. One. That's what I was going to, I was well, going to say so. that the, the, the picks that you've made are the stories, aren't they? They're not just kind of, oh, that sonically or that lyrically sounds good. There's a meaning behind it. Yeah. I think it's a really well thought out um, three yeah. beat actually. I was just thinking, I was like, ah, thank you. Because I, I, like I said, like they've all got huge backlogs, haven't yeah. they? Songs that like, you can choose so many that will like get you on the dance floor or that are like more current and stuff. But I think I have a connection to all three of those mm. songs that kind of goes beyond, oh, this makes me want to jump up and dance. Yeah, so definitely. yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go for, for those three. Brilliant. Absolutely. I Thank think you. I really enjoyed that three people, like I said, for the reason that they all have a storytelling um underlying theme and i think that really says a lot about yourself as well and the kind of things that you're doing and the things that you are going to do especially with the book so i i, I definitely see some uh, some resonance uh with that this is the part of the show where we ask are you roots or rhymes so we'll move on to the final part of the show suck and it's the final question that we ask all guests and um, you can answer it in any way you want, interpret it any way you want. But Suk Orjula, are you Roots or are you Rhymes? It's got to be Roots. Yes. <laughs> it's got to be Roots for me, for sure, for sure, for sure. It's taken me so long to embrace my punjabi to embrace my heritage, my culture, my language, to be proud of it, that now, yeah, I yeah, it's it's always roots, and I used to feel a bit embarrassed. I'd get into cars with friends, and they'd be like, "Have you not heard a song by the the song or this whatever?" And I'd be like, "Uh, no, I haven't." And now I'm like, "No, I haven't." But must need to sing on. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with so you? So I think <laughs> what, what is this new crap? <laughs> I'm out and out freshers, proud. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what is this? Uh, I was also gonna put Mukid sing because I very. This is my last thing I'm going to say about music choice, how I think about it. When I did the Lash and Network for the clip that went viral, mm. I came on to Malik Singh. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. And I chose that song partly jokingly, um, partly because the Asian Network, mm. even though it's the Asian Network, not to kind of like, I'm having a bit of a dig, but didn't have the Punjabi song that I wanted them to no have. No way. So I gave him like three or four. And I and I was like, what do you mean you don't have like a Jackie Mujahidi? Like, what's wrong with you? Like, what do you? Is this not in everybody's language? <laughs> Which I, you know, like a bit, <laughs> it was a bit niche. I was like, do you not have that? Do you not? I was like, no, do you not have that song? Um, so, so I kind of chose that half jokingly, half because it's a really fun mm. song, you know, and it's because something that we kind of 
grew up listening. Suk, you have expressed that you are 100% roots, which is fantastic. And I think anybody that's listening uh, to the podcast is definitely, definitely going to be able to to hear that with what you, you've had to say today. And it's been a great show. But right now is an opportunity for you to plug anything you've got going on, any shows coming up. Obviously, the book, this is your uh, opportunity to plug. Um, I think, well, really, it's all a bit here, but the Life Six tour has not been cancelled. It's just been postponed. I think a lot of people were worried they've been sort of run off with their money to Bali or something. Uh, <laughs> um, I, <laughs> it's, it's still going ahead. If you've got, got tickets to my shows, we're figuring out what to do it, get all the dates, but it's just the day I'll kind of set then. I will be back and you worry. So yeah, please do continue to like support live comedy, not just me, but in general, like support comedians in a way, like live comedy is in a really bad way at the moment because covered by the like the arts funding or anything like that. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and apart from that, what else? That's it. That's all I want to say. And also just drink water and tell people you love them. Great, great advice. Great advice. I think that's the most <laughs> important I always message. Promote. Drink, drink that- party. Yes. Your loved one, hug your loved one if you can. That is the most important <laughs> advice that we're taking out of this podcast is tell people you love them <laughs> and make sure you drink that Barney. And don't buy elephant at die anymore. Asleep. Yeah, exactly. It's very important. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, stop you know, it. We're gonna boycott. Boycott <laughs> elephant at <die. laughs> Again, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. It's been a great conversation. You know what? I've lied. I could talk to you forever. Oh, you can just call me if you want. <laughs> just like, we'll have a chat. No problem. Have a chat. Have a chat. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to you uh, yeah, when we'll be the tour call. is back, uh, being in Leeds, of course. But everybody should yeah. check out the Life Sucks tour and try and get tickets to your local shows. It, it's definitely going to be a great one. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Suck Audula. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.